Hey everyone! Welcome to our last story in the Little Golden Book series. Today I have chosen to read to you about the White House. But there are many, many more Little Golden Books and I really encourage you to go and read them. And don't forget, all the information you need to find them is in the description below. And now, let's read on. The White House is the President's home. It's probably not like most houses you know. It has 132 rooms, 35 bathrooms, 28 fireplaces, 8 staircases, 3 elevators, a tennis court, a basketball court, a movie theatre and a swimming pool. In 1789, the United States of America was a young country. The first president, George Washington, lived in New York City. But at that time, a new capital was being planned. It would be called Washington, D.C. Congress voted to build a house for the president there. A contest was held to find good designs for the president's home. People from all over were invited to send in their ideas. President Washington chose the winning design by an Irish-American man named James Hoban. Washington also chose the site of the new building and even marked where the walls would stand. Construction began. There was no time to waste. The new house had to be ready for the second president by December 1st, 1800, eight years away. But on the day that President John Adams moved in, the house wasn't finished. The plaster on the walls was still wet. Building supplies sat on the lawn. And where the grand staircase should have been, there was a big hole. Fresh whitewash coated the outside of the building. Although it was known as the President's House, people soon started calling it the White House. The next president, Thomas Jefferson, added two low passageways to hide stables, a laundry and storage. He also installed water closets, which were early toilets. Jefferson opened the White House to the public and hosted 4th of July parties. He believed it wasn't only the president's house, it was the people's house. In 1814, when America was at war with Britain, British troops invaded Washington. They set fire to several buildings in the capital. President Madison, who was at a nearby battlefield, wrote to his wife Dolly. He warned her to be ready to leave quickly. As the British troops neared, Dolly fled. But she made sure that important items, including a large painting of George Washington, were taken in a wagon to safety. British soldiers marched up and set the White House ablaze. A thunderstorm helped put out the flames, but the outside walls were scorched. Everything inside was gone. When the war ended, President Madison asked James Hoban to rebuild the White House. Three years later, President Monroe moved in. The White House continued to change inside and outside, but the painting Dolly Madison ordered to be saved still hangs in the East Room today. As Jefferson had done, President Lincoln opened the White House to the people, to ordinary folks, as well as leaders of all sorts. One guest was Frederick Douglass, a famous African-American writer he wanted black people, women and people in some other countries who did not have many rights back then to be treated more fairly. The White House welcomed kids too. Back in the 1800s, children in Washington liked to roll Easter eggs down Capitol Hill. But the ground was getting torn up, so a law was passed to stop using the Capitol's lawn. Where could the children go? maybe to the White House. In 1878, 
President Hayes had the gates opened for them. Since then, the White House has hosted an Easter egg roll nearly every year. Kids use cooking spoons to roll eggs across the South Lawn. Afterward, they're given colourful wooden eggs as keepsakes. At times, the White House has seemed to be full of kids. When Theodore Roosevelt was president, his six children had fun sliding down the staircase on metal trays and roller skating in the basement. The president's family lives on the second floor where President Roosevelt also worked back then. But it was noisy and crowded, so Roosevelt replaced the greenhouses on the west side with offices. This new area became known as the West Wing. President Roosevelt's kids had lots of pets, dogs, horses and birds. Alice Roosevelt even had a green snake named Emily Spinach. She took it to parties in her purse. Many other animals have lived at the White House. First, Lady Grace Coolidge had a pet raccoon. Macaroni the Pony was a gift from the Vice President to Caroline Kennedy. And Laddie Boy, President Harding's terrier, had his own seat at meetings, a special hand-carved chair. For a long time, the White House kept cows for milk and grew food in greenhouses. In 2009, First Lady Michelle Obama planted a kitchen garden next to the tennis court. The vegetables fed not only the president and his family, but also homeless people in the city. The president's office is called the Oval Office. Each president chooses the desk, rug, drapes and paintings for it. President Kennedy and many other presidents have used the Resolute desk. It's made from the timbers of the Resolute, a British ship that once explored the Arctic. The desk was a gift from Queen Victoria of England in 1880. From the Oval Office, Presidents can look out at the Rose Garden. That's where President Kennedy welcomed the Mercury astronauts and where President Nixon's daughter Tricia got married. Over time, the trees grow bigger. New flowers are planted. Leaves fall. Winter comes. One president's term ends. The next one begins. But through it all, the White House remains. Thank you for listening everyone. I really hope that these stories encourage you to go and read more books about American landmarks and American presidents. Take care and see you soon.